You know, today we're going to begin to start a new four-part message series that I'm entitling Fake News. I know, you've never heard that term before, right? Fake news. Made famous by our president, um, but, uh, you know, he's not the first one to use that. The enemy of life uses it with, with great regularity and much success and uh, duping us to believe lies instead of the truth. And I can tell you that from my life, um, uh, one of the beauties of living longer is that uh, you get a chance to see what works, what doesn't work. I get a chance to see when I have actually believed something that was wrong, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, and it did not lead to a good place. But all throughout history, the enemy of life has been using fake news. And, um, you know, if you're looking for a, a definition, you could say, well, fake news is either an outright lie, Okay, we, we get that. Or maybe it's a partial or incomplete truth. Has somebody ever given you part of the truth and they didn't just give you the rest of it? You would have made a different decision had they told you the whole story. But they gave you part of it. And really, that's a methodology of a presentation that is um, manipulative and deceptive. Something that people do to us, and it's unfortunate, when people do that, when they're trying to manipulate us or deceive us, um, and be assured that the enemy of life is hard at doing that. He is going for it to manipulate and to deceive. And so when we face information of any type, it's very important that we realize we have to run it through a biblical filter. You know, um, I need to have my mind have a filter in it uh, you know, just like you do with your air condition unit. You don't want to take in air that's not good. You want it filtered to pollen and different things. So in the same way, I have to have my mind have a filter on it that filters out that which is not profitable, that which is going to lead me to a wrong decision in some areas. And so the news or information being presented in fake news is false or incomplete. It's a substitute for the whole story. And we need to allow our minds to properly label things. Um, I am big on this. If you've been around me any length of time, uh, you'll know that I'm big. Label it properly. If you label something properly, you have a shot at making a good decision. If you label it wrongly, you have no shot because you're just letting anything in. It's so critical that we be able to say what is false, false, what is good, good, and um, otherwise we're going to suffer in that realm. And certainly, do not rebroadcast fake news. Um, you know, uh, sometimes we use the words like gossip, um, but anything that we know is not quite right or fully right, don't go about and speak it as truth. Matthew twelve thirty six says, But I tell you, Jesus speaking, that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. So, you know, we're not talking, you, if you're sitting here and thinking, oh, I'm, I'm skipping uh, Judgment Day because I'm, uh, you know, I'm saved. I'm just going right there. No, you're, you, we all go through that Judgment Day where we're standing before the Lord. And we are going to be held accountable for every word that is spoken or not spoken that should have been spoken. Every word that is empty, empty means without substance. It, there, there's nothing to it or there's something poor for, to it. So we don't want to have an empty word. And so in this four-week study, it's not my heart for you to just be able to recognize fake news. That's, that, that's uh, yeah, I hope you do. I want you to see it so you can reject it. See it so you can correct it in others and see it so you can measure the information you hear according to God's standard. We need to understand that the author and pusher of deceit, of fake news, 
is really the enemy of life. Jesus is talking about this in John 8, 44, and he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. That's how you become a murderer. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. It is so important that you make decisions off of truth. And that may seem to you as I'm saying that, well, duh, Pat, I, I get that. Uh, uh, of course, I, I don't want to make a decision off of a lie. No, but we do it all the time. We just don't recognize it, and we need to arrest our thinking and realize it is crick, uh, critical. I'm going to read a, uh, just a s short little section on this whole um, element of fake news, and then we're going to delve into our, our real subject here. But in Nehemiah 4, 1 through 6, I've read this to you before. When San, uh, as you know, uh, Nehemiah was going to Jerusalem, was rebuilding walls that had been torn down, and he was granted the right, the papers, to go and take some Jews with him and to rebuild the wall. And in verse 1, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life that have been heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. And then Nehemiah cries out, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over to plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till it had reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Fake news is used by the enemy of life to bully you, to ridicule you, to demean you and your efforts. The things God has called you to do, the things he has set on your heart, here's, here's your assignment. Here's what's written on your scroll. Here's your assignment. Uh, the enemy is after ridiculing you, bullying you into not accomplishing that, um, making you a laughing stock and getting other people to join him in that process. And so that's where we find ourselves. I'm just going to read uh, a little bit more so you see the rest of how this works. Skip on, on down to Nehemiah 6, 1 through 9. And when word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors or the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. And they, uh, there's your hint, Ono. Oh, That's your hint. But they were scheming to harm me. Okay, there's the scheme. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying out a great project, and I can't go down. Why should I, the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Normally, by the way, the enemy of life will be relentless. You know, I, I'm trying to have that same uh, tendency, but for righteousness. I want to be relentless for righteousness. The enemy is going to be relentless. I'm going to match him in being relentless. And verse 5. Then the fifth time, Samballad sent his aid to me with the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, quote, It is reported among the nations that Geshem, and Geshem says it's true, must be true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt and therefore, you're building the wall. 
Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judea. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. I sent him this reply. That's what Nehemiah says. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You are just making it up in your head. And I know we see a lot of fake news today that is just made up in somebody's head. But you need to stand strong. You need to stand up. And you need to speak up on what is truth and what is error. And he did like that. He just flat out said it. Nothing that what you're saying is really happening. Verse 9. And they were trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it won't be completed. See, fake news is designed to bring fear, to immobilize you, to paralyze you, to create wrong thinking and therefore wrong decisions, and wrong decisions lead to wrong habits, and wrong habits lead to wrong actions. Every bit of information that you take in must be measured by what God says. No matter how culturally acceptable it really is. We see a lot of what is culturally acceptable right now. But we have to measure it against God's word. A church, an individual, a nation that believes a point of view not found in the rock of Scripture will receive the just consequences of a holy and righteous God. Hear me on that. Nobody's getting away with anything. They will receive the just consequences from a holy and righteous God. Is God loving, Pat? No, isn't he loving? Sure, he's loving. But he's also holy and righteous, and he won't be mocked. He wants the best for us, but not at the disgrace of his character. Scripture says in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. You know, this thing of reaping and sowing, you've heard a lot about it, but um, preachers didn't invent that. It's right here. What you do has a, res- has a result. If you plant an acorn tree, you get an oak tree, not an orange tree. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. And so we reap what we sow, and God wants you to reap blessing and favor and provision and truth. But you choose, and I choose, by our actions or inactions, and we reap the appropriate consequence of blessing or opposition to God that we plant it. So God's heart is for us to know the truth and to engage the truth and be set free, as it says in John 8, 32. That's his heart, to know the truth and to be set free. Only when you label something properly are you going to be able to know the truth. And and how does that happen? It happens with humility. Um, I have to know that I don't know everything. And you might say, well, yeah, Pat, that's obvious. You don't know different uh, geometric things or engineering things or there's so much like that that you don't know. No, 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 no. Uh, you're, You're way off target. I don't really know all that God wants until I humbly ask him, open my heart, and I'm willing to hear from his word what to do. He wants his favor to fall upon you and our community, our nation. Our nation has pushed God aside. Would you say that's true? And it's time to rise up and let his voice be heard through your lips. His voice heard through your lips. Yours and my lips. Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? Okay, two people do. Anybody else? Yes. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, he has a voice. He desires his voice to come out. And he 
waits till you open your mouth. It's like speaking in tongues. When you, when you are praying in tongues, you are saying, Holy Spirit, I am going to unengage this trying to make sense of everything, and I need your Spirit to connect with your Holy Spirit and bring understanding that would otherwise have not hit me. And so we need to open our mouth and let His voice come out. And that's the only way our nation will experience the revival that it needs. The nation needs revival. Maybe you would raise your hand and say, uh, I need personal revival. Maybe you'd say, my family needs revival. My city needs revival. My neighbors need revival. Okay, all those things are true. But we have to embrace the call of Jesus if we're going to ever experience that. So, if the Bible is our standard of what is truth... And what is fake news or a lie, then um, God wants to be clear to us. Is that right? You've heard me say umpteen times, God does not want his, mis his will to be a mystery to you. He doesn't want that. He wants to be clear. So he gave us his word. And if we use that as our standard, we really can discern what is truth and what is a lie or fake news. And so all of you know all the word of God that you really need to listen to me make seven statements and decide if it's truth or if it is fake. So, truth, fake. You like that? Okay. So here we go. Statement number one. Tell me if it's truth or fake news. God does not want babies murdered. Truth! Truth! God doesn't want babies murdered. Next question, or next statement. God wants people to be confused if they were be made to be a man or a woman. Fake news! You guys are so good. You know a lot of the word. I can tell that already. Okay, God wants a nation to support looting, violence, and rioting. Fake news. You know your word. <laughs> okay, God wants nations on this planet to fully support and bless Israel. Truth. I knew you knew a lot of the word. Look at this. God wants your tax dollars to support Planned Parenthood. Fake news. Okay. How about this one? God approves of gender, gender identity men using a girl's bathroom. Fake news. Oh, I'm so impressed with you. Give you one more. God endorses closing church gatherings over 10 people. Fake news. Oh, my goodness. You all impressed me. I can't believe that. So do you see what just happened? You just used the Bible, and now you know how to vote in the upcoming election. It's real simple. All you got to do is just apply biblical standards to the issues we face in life and make a decision. Now, I know that was kind of a joke, but it really wasn't. It was the truth of what we're facing in an election, and, you know, that's something you're going to have to deal with, and I pray that um, you're faithful to do your God responsibility and vote. But beyond that, every issue you face is found in here, and you know what it is sometimes just by the Word of God you already have inside you. So, fake news tries to, or the lies of the enemy, try to rip us away from walking in the truth of God. So I told you there's four weeks. That was my introduction. Did you like that? That was the introduction. We only have another hour or two to go. We're all good here. So today's fake news message title involves the lie of who is in charge. 
the lie of who is in charge. From God's word, we're going to clearly see who is in charge and who is not as far as how things happen in your life. We'll start with Psalms 121, 1 through 3. Scripture says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. How many people have seen the mountains? Few of you have seen mountains. Big stuff. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you won't slumber. He isn't going to close his eyes. He's always alert. He sees what's going on, and he sees that. So on the first thing, on who is really in control, we have to realize that when we face a COVID scare, when we face a job loss or hour cut scare, when we face a scare with our child or our parent, when we face a scare of some other type of situation, we have to remember who is in charge. That's where faith comes from. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the Word of God. He gives me His Word. It gives me strength and understanding and clarity to know who's really in charge. See, if you think that that COVID-19 is so big that God cannot deal with it, you'll be fearful. I don't want you to be fearful. Taking precautions, all good. Taking legitimate precautions that you feel are are necessary, that health officials tell you are are, uh, uh, necessary, all good, as long as you kind of weigh it out and you try and figure out, is it really fake news, is it truth? Which, Which one do you think, God? You know in your spirit. But beyond that, my big thing to you is don't fear a disease. Don't fear a financial downturn. Don't fear something that erupts on you. In fact, Proverbs says, don't be afraid of sudden fear. Because the enemy likes us to terrorize us. Don't be afraid of sudden fear. First thing when you face a, something that's about to give you sudden fear, take it to the Lord. Get his perspective on it. I lift my eyes to the mountains. This person obviously lives in the mountains. Who's writing this? I, I don't know if this was David or one of the others that wrote this psalm. But lives in the mountainous area, and all he says is, all I got to do is look at that and realize who made that. That's who's going to be my help. That's who's going to be my help. If you lived on the ocean, you'd probably say, look out there. See that big ocean? That's who's going to be my help. God is in charge. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So not only are diseases and financial issues and all that not in charge, I'm not in charge. To some of you, that may be a revelation. I am not asking you to be irresponsible. Irresponsible. Be responsible to the things that God has given you responsibility over. That's normal. That's godly. That's biblical. But I am saying you have to realize you're not God. He is. He is the one who bought us for a price. And we act like we're in charge. And we're not. And we're not. Scripture tells us that God overshadows COVID-19 in any health issue you face today. He is in charge. Why should we walk in fear? Isaiah, you know, one of the best things you can possibly do is go to the word. If you don't know the word enough right now and you're in a jam and you remember a certain word, all you got to do is go to Google 
and start plugging in what you remember from that scripture, and boom, it pops up. So, I mean, you can find scriptures to help you. But let's look at this Isaiah 54, 17. I employ this all the time on health issues. You can probably finish it for once I say the first few words. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. You know, um, sometimes we face threats. And we got to realize the threat is designed to bring terror and the belief that God is not in control. Sometimes we face accusations as from the enemy, sometimes from ourselves. You'll never do that, Pat. You haven't been able to do it before accusations sometimes we'll face um, something that you're afraid of what could happen and the enemy brings that to your attention but scripture says no weapon nothing that can come against you will prosper he gives provision this is another thing scripture says that he is in charge i remember 10 years ago in our printing business within a 10 minute phone call I lost the largest customer of my company representing a quarter of our income, a quarter of our whole company. I was the only one that was that big. Everybody else had, you know, had lots of other customers in 40, uh, 40 states. But I lost this one, and I lost a quarter of my income. Is God my provider, or is that customer my provider? In that moment, I had to remind myself of that truth. That God is my provider. God is my help. I remember uh, another time I worked for a man who just who moved from Washington D.C. and and started a big endeavor. And I worked for him and and had been working for him on great trajectory. I was running the company for him. And um, one day he calls me in his office and he fired me. Who is my provider? I have to remind myself, God. Now, later the next morning, he called me and said, shouldn't have done that. Come back to work. <laughs> I hate that when they jerk your emotions around like that, right? Um, but you get the point. Whether he did or not, I have to realize that God is my provider. God is the one who gives us direction. God will maneuver you into position to show you his direction whether you realize it or not. A lot of the times that you th have things happening in your life, you think they're bad. God is maneuvering you into position for the next thing. You know, I, I didn't see that I was going to be the, your senior pastor. But God began maneuvering me in position. And then when he said, okay, I want you to do it, Pat, boom. I was in position. I didn't see it coming. How many times have you had a job offer or something else, but it was preceded by something that looked a little weird? God is moving you into position as he exposes his new direction for your life. God is the God who gives comfort. He gives comfort. He is in charge of comfort. What is the whole, one of the Holy Spirit's name? The comforter. That's one of the attributes and names of the Holy Spirit. And I remember when my mom got sick on one day and one week later, she died. Totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. I remember that, and he was my comfort. I remember three years later, Sheila's dad suddenly died. And the Holy Spirit was her comforter. Helping her through that time. He is in charge of comfort. He gives favor and blessing because he is in charge. He gives real change. Maybe there's an area that you're, you're looking at right now and you're, you're saying, I need some change in my life. I need something to break, something to change. What areas are those that need to change? You know, some of you have been facing the issue you're facing long enough 
that you're on the verge of hopelessness. But that's not God's name, hopelessness. His name is hope. And he is in charge of change. And he can and will bring change. And the last little thing I want to say is that God is in charge of revival. What in the world is revival? We all come from different backgrounds. To some people, it was when I was growing up, they took the football field and they brought in a special evangelist and they had a revival and people did hear um, the truth of God for the first time and many people got saved. I don't know if anybody got healed at that event, but it was a revival. So in my mind, that was revival. But I want to say that Revival can be personal revival. Revival can be in Freedom Fellowship. Revival can be in Longwood or Apopka or Mount Dora or Sanford. Revival can be in the state of Florida. Revival can be in a nation. But revival starts... How does revival start, by the way? You you all probably know. What would would be your guess of how revival starts? I can't hear you. Personal starts with us. Absolutely. Perfect. And then what 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 does it do in us? What do we do? Usually we're praying. Oh, God, something has to change. Help us or help our nation or wherever, whatever the thing is. So we pour out our heart to God. And then God in his goodness starts exposing, well, let's start with you, Pat. This needs to change. This needs to be repented of. And so repentance comes in and becomes, we, God opens our eyes to things that have either eluded us. We didn't see it as strongly as we do now. Or we didn't give it the proper value. It's really important to God. Maybe it needs to be important to me. Or we just turned our back on it. But at this point, he brought it up again. And we have a chance to repent. All those things are the soil from which revival can really happen and really change. And so God is in charge, not the government. God is in charge, not your money or lack thereof. God is in charge, not your needs, your desires, your addictions, or your sin tendencies. In fact, let's just bottle it. You are not in charge. God is in charge, and he rules, and all other beliefs come From fake news. God is in charge. All other beliefs come from fake news. This will not hold up in days of intense struggle. This will hold up in days of struggle. And so God is the one who wants to change our hearts, to move us toward repentance, to move us toward revival and real change. And during these next four weeks, we are going to be unpacking individual things that are preparing our hearts and minds for real change and revival. And so the first one that we have to get is, I am not in charge. Neither is the government. And neither are health issues, and neither is my money or the lack thereof, or my good career or my bad career. God is in charge. Let's pray. Father God, I humbly come to you with all my friends that are both here and those that are watching online. Father, you know what's going on. You know if people have been walking in fear instead of faith. You know if faith has been para- uh, fear has been paralyzing them. Or you know, Father, if they have been unwilling to move to the place you've called them because they are walking and believing in fake news, in a lie. 
and they are experiencing a lesser quality of kingdom life than you have for them. And so, Father, for everybody that's listening, I just ask, oh God, that you would bring truth, the strainer of truth to their mind right now as they consider you, oh God. And they will rightly answer you, not me. Am I walking in fear in any particular area? Or am I walking in fully convinced, all in faith? And if you're saying that there's aspects of your life that you've been walking in, you may say, not fear. Oh, it's just caution, Pat. Okay, call it what you want. You know what God's trying to get across to you. If you've been walking in a way that is less than being an ambassador for Christ, I would ask you to repent of that right now. Repentance is the forerunner of change. And if you have put your trust in your money or your job that still has hours attached to it, or your health that's so good, and you're not putting your trust in the maker of heaven and earth, then I encourage you to acknowledge that before him who knows your heart. And say, God, I've been trusting in my intellect. I've been trusting in my wealth. I've been trusting in my ability to pay the bills. I've been trusting in my friendships or my parents. But I'm not really all in with you. And if that's you today, would you be so wise as to repent and receive his forgiveness and his empowerment. And Father, for those that have been so consumed with COVID thoughts that somehow your great power has been neutered in their activity of their fellowship of you. God, I ask you would bring conviction and repentance. Father, we do not want to be a people who are passive. We do not want to be a people who are irresponsible. We do not want to be a people satisfied with religion and religiosity. We want to walk in your power, in your might, in your clarity, in your goodness, in your provision, in your favor, in your grace. We want to be usable by you, not on the sidelines. We want to follow through with what's on your agenda and set our agenda to the side so we can pick up your agenda. And so, holy God, here we are. We sang that you are the great I am, and you are. We sang that you are so good, and you are. But, Lord, I ask that you would deal with our hearts today. That you would deal with our thinking today. That we would have the privilege of hearing you right now. And we will set down what we have in our hand and pick up what you want us to pick up. We will open our mouth so that your voice has lips 
to go through. Lord, I pray during these next few weeks of bringing our hearts to a soft point of revival, that we become that mighty church body, that mighty church family that you've been looking for to rise up here. So, Lord, we want all of you. Tell, tell him right now. Tell him aloud. I want all of you. I want all of you. So, Father God, we recognize that you are in charge, and therefore we recalibrate our thinking to ask you first what you want done instead of just doing it. What do you want done for lunch, God? Who do you want me to call, God? Who do you want me to not waste time with right now so I can have time available for what you want? What do you want, God? I'm yours. You bought me. Don't know why you'd want me, but you bought me. Here I am. Empower me with your Holy Spirit. And let's do your bidding here on earth, Almighty God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I am flat out excited for where we're going as a church, where you are going to be going. I think you're going to be surprised at the coming days. I am praying for divine surprises for you. Now, if, if something came to your mind as we were praying and you feel stuck in some fashion, I've asked Dan and Roe to come down here and they are uh, really desirous of hearing the Lord and being able to pray for you and help you through whatever you're going through um, at this point. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing so many more next week. I know we had so many out sick, and uh, um, I'm looking at uh, at least eight or nine families that we'll be seeing back here um, next week in the building, which is great. Um, so uh, thank you for coming. God bless you. I look forward to this amazing week ahead. And go in the blessing of the Lord. Amen. One more quick announcement. I forgot to announce earlier there is not going to be a worship night tonight. Um, we're trying to do that month. Uh, monthly but in light of where we're at on different elements right now we weren't able to pull that off so that'll be next month it'll always be the third saturday of the month god bless you